Lord is faithful, isn't he? I'm going to trust you had a good weekend last weekend, and as we had a, had a break, you had some time to relax, and I hope you had a time for those of you who have not yet read the Gospel of John to take the time to read the Gospel of John. It only takes a few hours, and I, I'm just always amazed going through again, even on a different translation, what all surfaces every time I read that Gospel. We had last week, my wife was talking about um, in chapter 18, verses 1 to 11, was the whole arrest. The tied in with the betrayal where Judas betrayed him and then Jesus got arrested. And that was right after the time when he had spent the, the hours with them, talking with them after the Lord's Supper. And that brings us up to the time when he crossed the Kidron Valley, goes to the other side, and then is betrayed. And what we're, where we're picking it up today is from chapter 18, starting with verse number 12. And so I'm just going to read a few verses here before we pray. So the, and I'm reading from the Brian Study Bible. So the Roman cohort and commander of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him and led him to Anus first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now, Caiaphas was one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. And let's skip down then to verse 37. For this I have been born, Jesus says, and I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? Let's pray. Father, we commit ourselves to you. We commit to you the word. Uh, Lord, we've had uh, time of singing and praise and giving back to you of tithes and offerings. And I pray now, Lord, as we look at your word, open it up to us, Lord. Let me speak it with clarity, simplicity. Open our ears to hear what you're telling us here in 2018. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Taking a look at this passage of Scripture and dividing it into four parts, uh, and the, the title being Trials, and as you've received the text or the SMS, and if you haven't received it, let the ushers know and they'll write your name down if you would like to get updates of what's happening here on Sunday nights. And the message tonight is, is asking ourselves the question, what is the source of trials? Do we understand the source of our trials? Is it from God or is it from man? Because what happens is we go through life and we get all kinds of trials, things that happen. Uh, good things happen, and what, when good things happen to us, many times we don't ask so many questions. We don't ask the deep questions of life. But when tough times come, then all of a sudden we start asking, how did this come? Is this, uh, in, we, we often maybe first check ourselves, did, did, did I do something wrong? Or did, did somebody else do something wrong? Or what's happening? And then we end up, if we don't have answers there, then we say, okay, God, what did you do? <laughs> or sometimes we blame the devil. Devil, he's, he's doing this. And, and so these questions come up. Uh, I want us to also ask the questions in the good times, when things are good, ask the same. When blessings come, where do blessings come from? And we say, well, we, we should know the answer for that. Yes, yes, so we think we know where the answers come from. But God gives also wisdom for us to walk a certain pathway in life so that if we walk a certain pathway, we'll receive the blessings of God. Uh, for example, they say one of the most common uh, w ways that people trip at home, in their home, trip and fall, is because of carpets. So, what do you do? <laughs> Either lift your feet higher or get rid of the carpets. There's things that we can do in life to avoid potential problems. And so, as it is on a very simple matter like that, so it is in the bigger picture of life. We can walk a certain way and therefore then watch the blessings of God come. When we plant a seed into the ground, it's very important to water the seed. And the best thing to do with the seed is to add water. Uh, 
not necessarily coffee or Coke. In our lives, the Word of God comes in, and what are we watering it with? And we can receive the blessings of God, or, or we don't. And then we start asking ourselves some bigger life questions. So this passage today, we're going to look at trials. And it was very interesting as I went through this because I read it many, many times before. I preached on it, and, and when I was going through it for this time, it was again fascinating to see as I, as I was reading it through, Lord, what's, what's, what's here? What's for us today? Give us, the, give us something from what you've got for us to, to hear from your spirit this day. So I look at four things. First of all, there's, there's trials that come here. First of all, let's look at the first trial, and that's a mock trial. This comes up in the first few verses, and I read the verses uh, 1 to 12, and it says here that it, it talks about uh, Ananias, who, who was uh, the, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest. It says high priest that year. Well, Already there, you, you underline that, take a note, and go, there's a little problem here because in the Old Testament, and verified again by the book of Hebrews, is that high priests, when they're in, they're in for life. That's what happens. You get a priest, come, a high priest comes in, he's in. So how can you have him that year? Well, because the system was already so corrupt at that time that they were switching high priests virtually every other year. And... Um, and then look, look who's the high priest previously. These are relatives. We see the issue of nepotism is not new. It was there in the old boys club that was happening here. And so this whole trial is an absolute mockery from the start. So when, the, when Jesus was arrested, as we learned last week, when he was arrested, he was taken up. Um, from these cohorts, and, and uh, they, they, they had the connections. They had connections into the Roman system, so they got themselves a number of soldiers, and they came, and it wasn't just a, a group of uh, Jewish people. They, they actually had uh, government backing on this, corrupt as it was, but they did have uh, these soldiers come. But they, they bring them to this absolute mockery of a system here. Uh, first of all, it was at nighttime as well, and that, you don't have courts running at nighttime. And so they come here to this uh, corrupt system. Now, the, the, it's broken up into two parts here. The second part of this is Peter's trial is in chapter 18, uh, verses 19 to 24. And it says here in verse 19, Then the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. And you got to love Jesus. And look what he says here. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and the temple where all the Jews come together, and I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them, and they know what I said. And when he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus, saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, If I spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? So Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Well, it just said earlier that he was the high priest. How can it be there? And it shows what, what basically happened here if you study that period of time. They actually had, because they kept rotating high priests, um, what happened was there was a collection of high priests, and they, they were the ones, together with others, formulated what, we, what they call there the, the Sanhedrin, and this would be the ruling elite. They had the, the religious and the political clout uh, for the Jewish people. And here they are meeting at nighttime. Um, I love it in 20 where Jesus answered him. He says, I've, I've sp I spoke openly. I go into the synagogues, I go into the temple, I go into open places, I go into the mountainside, I go on the lakeside, I go where there's openness. And yet the whole contrast here is that they're being hauled into at night, quietly, secretly, hidden away from the eyes of justice of the Roman government. Um, 
what to do. What does Jesus do? He just, he just bears it. He understands that the whole thing's a mockery. He knows where he's going. And he doesn't even fight it. He just lets it, lets it slide by. Uh, tough to look at. The disciples were looking at this. Uh, we, can, we can see that many of them ran away. A couple of them, however, as we'll see in a minute, they, they hung in and wanted to see what's going on. The mock trial is something that when it's faced with, when we are faced with issues of life, you know, work, circumstances, there's an old saying, life is not fair. Life is not fair. Here's a classic example. It's not fair. And his disciples repeatedly faced the same thing. They were in circumstances where it wasn't fair, as Paul would have been taken as a Roman soldier several times, or a Roman citizen taken several times and beaten. Is life fair? No. What does he do? At first, nothing. And in the right time, he speaks up, as does Jesus. Anyway, so that's that one. This is a very simple one. The whole thing's a scam anyways, the, this trial that, that happens here in the, in the house of um, Annas. So let's move on here to the next one. Well, let's look at the second trial that happens here. Um, Simon Peter, verse 15. We've got to go back now to 15. These things are, are, are like a jigsaw here. So let's go back to 15. Uh, Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside, and so the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then a slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are, not, uh, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He, she said, I am not. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold and they were warming themselves, and Peter was also with them, standing there warming himself. Um, Peter is following at a distance. He is watching this absolute mock trial going on for his master, his teacher, and he's not even aware that he himself is on trial. He's concerned, he thinks about Jesus, but while he's standing there warming himself, he's also put on trial. How? Let's go down to verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, and so they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I'm not. And one of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? Let me just stop there for a minute. Interesting, my wife has just shared that last time about the cutting off of the ear. Uh, what, what happens is that it's interesting. This, this was written now several decades later, that this connection was made that these two are actually related here. And you could, I, 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 we, we don't have proof of this, but maybe one day some historical documents will surface, maybe some more digging in the Dead Sea area. But probably, no doubt, that the guys whose ear was cut off became one of the early Christians. Yeah, because they, decades later, they, they remember exactly who he was and who his relatives were. Back to the text, 27. Then Peter... Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Nothing else is said from John. And if we were to only read John, we would read this and just keep reading. And then go, oh yeah, it's a minute, I read something earlier. And that would bring us back to chapter 13 and verse 38. And so if you have that, just go back to 13. It's a passing comment and unless one had made a note of it, now it's the other gospel writers that talk a little bit more here. But let's look at John 13, 38. This is just a few hours earlier. Jesus talked with, with them, and he says he's going to be betrayed. And, of course, Peter, being the good vocal spokesman, said, no, 
Uh, you will not betray. We, we won't betray you. Absolutely not. And then Jesus has to say, well, Peter, I got something to tell you. Um, he says to him in verse 38, you want to die for me? I tell you the truth, Peter, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. Another translation has here, the rooster will not crow until you deny me. That, that, he said that at, at the late night. Now, I don't know about you, but I, 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 like, I don't like to be woken up at four in the morning by roosters <laughs> or five in the morning. They can be pretty loud, and they don't mind what the circumstances are. It's where we live, we've got some neighbor just a few houses down. I'm glad there's, it's around a corner and a few houses down. Uh, but roosters, they just, they just let loose regularly, every day. They wake, wake the neighbors up, wake the rest of the chickens up. It's loud. It's not a quiet vibration on the cell phone. And so we get now to, to uh, and, and so Jesus says that, and he goes, and I can imagine Peter just hearing that in passing, thinking, yeah, 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 okay. And then life goes on. They get into Kidron Valley, all the action that happens there, the prayer and so forth, and, and then the arrest, and then the cutting off the ear, which he did himself. And so there's a lot going on in, in uh, Peter's mind. And now he's standing there warming himself, watching this mock trial. And while that mock trial is going on, he's on trial. He's tested, and he fails the test. And the alarm goes off. The rooster crows. And the other writers say he, he went out and he wept. He wept bitterly. The, the things that would have uh, gone through his mind, because he'd be seeing the, the mockery that, that's taking place, absolute injustice, to this pure, innocent rabbi who he traveled with. And he's seen uh, raise the dead. He's seen him uh, heal the sick. And now these, these absolute diabolical religious leaders are just going to take him to the cleaners. And the rooster crows. The alarms go off. And he's pierced to his heart. Well, there's more trials that happen. This, this chapter is loaded with trials. Let's go on to the third trial. There's a trial before Pilate. And there's two, two trials that actually happen here, two and one. Let's look at the first one. The first one is a public trial because in front of Pilate, well, there's actually multiple. If you put all the Gospels together, there's multiple uh, interviews that happen here. The first one is in verse 28 to 32 um, that, that happens here. I'll read here. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas. So in other words, he's, we, we, we've gone now from one high priest to another high priest. Now they take him to the praetorium, and it was early, and they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover, which is coming. 29, therefore Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered and said to him, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So Pilate said to him, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, we are not permitted to put anyone to death, but to fulfill the word of Jesus which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. It's, this one now is public. The rooster had crowed, showing, number one, the fulfillment of the words of Jesus, but more in context here, now the sun was rising. It's daytime. Daybreak has come. And now the Roman government is involved, and so they take him to the Roman government because they want to kill Jesus, and they don't have the authority to kill, and they want the Roman government to kill him on their behalf. And so, rather than getting defiled, and that's so ironic in itself because as we learn in the rest of scriptures, it teaches and Paul writes, it says the kingdom of God is not a matter of eat and drink, but a matter of righteousness, truth, correct? It's the issues of the heart. 
And so I find it so ironic that here these leaders don't want to defile themselves, and yet they're filthy and rotten and absolutely defiled on the inside. And it, and in fact, they're so defiled that if they were to walk on the praetorium ground, the grounds would be defiled because they are. It's like, don't, don't worry about getting defiled. You're the one defiling. So anyways, Pilate knows that stuff and sees beyond it. And so what, he, what does he do? He actually takes the initiative and he comes out to meet them. And so you've got this public uh, event going on now. And um, he argues with them, with these religious leaders. You, know, you do it. No, we can't do it. And so they've got this, this public trial about Jesus, but it's between Pilate and the people at that time. And then it moves. It moves now to the private world. And therefore, verse 33, And therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? This is a, a question now. This is, a, this is an interview. This is a test. This is a question. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? And Pilate answered I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you're a king. And Jesus answered, You say correctly that I'm a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. John summarizes this for us, but as we look through other, you take all the gospel accounts and put it together, what actually happens here is that in the meantime, he is taken to Herod. And so the, the amount of trials is actually incredible. How many? Annas, Caiaphas, the people, Pilate, Herod, back to Pilate again, publicly in front of Pilate, then privately with him. He asks the question, are you the king of the Jews? And he wants to know what's going on in his heart. He's asking him, the question. When we go through life, questions get asked. We ask ourselves the questions. The trials I'm going through, the tribulations I'm going through, if you're going through any, and they might be relational, they might be financial, they might be social, they might be at work, different places, all kinds of trials that one can go through. What's very important is to have the questions and to have the right questions. Now, Pilate is a representative of the government, so he knows exactly what questions to ask because he's got to get to the bottom of this thing. And so he asks him, are you a king? Because that was, that's what, exactly what the accusation is here. And, of course, they deliberately, the, the, the religious leaders deliberately threw out some accusations which they themselves didn't believe and had a different agenda for. And so Pilate picks up on that. Anyways... Um, he asked them very pointed questions and, and sometimes in the trials of Jesus he's absolutely quiet and sometimes he gives an answer and he's very deliberate and calculated. Uh, it's very important here to learn from Jesus at any point in time. Whatever trials he's, he goes through, he never reacts. He always acts. He gets his directives from God. And it's very important as we go through life to make sure that we get constantly our directives from God. As Christians, we are ambassadors, and so we must have to learn from Jesus. The, the complete irony of this, the king of kings, the one who made heaven and earth, stands before this mere mortal, and the mere mortal asks him questions. And, and of course, Jesus knows that he doesn't know all the information. And so he, he just politely answers the questions and has some comebacks. So we've looked at several trials here. The mock trial, um, Peter's trial, um, 
Pilate's trial, public, private. It's the last trial I want us to look at. I'm going to close with this one. Is that when Jesus stood before Pilate, the reality is, is that Pilate was the one who was on trial. Because Jesus is the judge. Jesus is going to ask some questions. Pilate had a chance. Everyone in this room, we have a chance today. Hebrews tells us, today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear the voice of God, do not harden your hearts. Today, while we're alive, we stand before the judge, the king of kings, and he's giving us the opportunity to be judged. And we, those who have accepted Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, have been judged already. I have. I remember the day when it was clear to me that I stood before a righteous king and I was a simple sinner. And I allowed and I understood judgment in my spirit and I was condemned to death. But by accepting the fact that we're guilty of our sins, something beautiful happens that Jesus says now to us, I have come to die for you. And as guilty as you are, I have taken your place. You can be free. So that when we come to the second judgment day, we will not be judged. If we submit to the judge while we're on earth, we have no fear of the second judgment. But if we do not bow our knees, if we do not submit, to the trial of life when Jesus knocks on our heart and says, do you want me as your personal Lord and Savior? If we don't respond, we will face him again after it's too late. And then there's no more chance. And so here, this fourth trial in this gospel starts in verse 34, chapter 18, verse 34. And it's basically a choice between Jesus and others. Choices as to who and what to listen to. Verse 34, Jesus answered, Are you saying this, when, when he had asked him, are you a king? He says, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? You see, there's choices that Pilate could make. Look who's speaking into Pilate's life. You've got, first of all, the religious leaders. Now, they've been complaining for quite some time, but this time they brought it up publicly and massively. They bring it up as, as one to him. And they rouse up a whole crowd to stand there and argue. Well, who else is there? It's religious leaders, the cloud. Then there's Herod. And up until this point, Herod, you read in the other Gospels, Herod and Pilate were not friends. They were rival kings, actually, sub-kings within the region. They didn't care for each other at all because they were both vying for position. But when the issue of Jesus came, actually through this, they became friends. How disgusting when people become friends based on a common enemy. That, that never works. That is an absolute, absolute dead-end friendship. It happened here. Who else spoke into his life? If you read Matthew, and this is the beauty about reading different Gospels together, if you read Matthew 27 and verse 19, you'll find that when he was about to say something, his wife comes to him and says, please don't touch. She doesn't just say, this man. She says, don't touch this innocent man. He's innocent. She says, for I've, I've had big troubles in my dreams last night about him. He has information 
coming to him from all different sides. And then last of all, now, Jesus is standing in front of him. And Jesus is telling about himself. And so when he asks, are you the king? And Jesus says, is this of your own initiative? What he was probing, and he's putting Pilate on trial, asking him, basically, what are you going to do with Jesus? The tables are turned. Um, then we go down to verse 37, and we ask ourselves the question, when, after life has given us choices, what do we choose with the choices? Verse uh, 37b, For this I have been born, Jesus said, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. The word truth, it's, it comes up a couple times here in the Greek. Uh, aletheia. What is truth? It's reality. In fact, in the Greek at that time, these words were virtually 100% interchangeable. And wherever you read in the Gospels, wherever it says, I tell you the truth, you can exchange it with the word reality and it makes just as much sense. It's absolutely uh, interchangeable. And so Jesus, if you can read, read this now. I've been born, for this I've been born, and for this I've come into the world to testify to reality. Everyone who lives in reality hears my voice. And so he's there standing in front of the top man at that time who has the power to put to free him or the power to kill him and he says to him i i'm bringing you i have come to bring you news of reality the news of it and to testify to reality and then we have that famous statement from pilate which has been said for 2000 years now it surfaces everywhere Pilate says to him, what is truth? What is reality? What did Jesus say? Chapter 14 and verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How do we get eternal life? This is eternal life, to know God, to know God and his Son whom he had sent. And to actually, and it's in 17.3. And then in, in John 20, this is eternal life. That they may believe that Jesus is the Christ. And so we have our questions before us. All of us have these choices to make. Now, when we go through life, we see things that appear sometimes to be unjust, unjust. And it doesn't work. And so we ask ourselves the question, and that's what I started this whole uh, session tonight with, was trials in life. Who are they from? And who's behind this? Where do our trials come from? Do you remember what James said? Let's t take a few minutes and look at James. Because James, being the pastor of the, uh, the church there in, in Jerusalem, he, he writes some things that are, very clear about this issue of let's look first of all in James 1 verse 2 and 3 my dear brothers and sisters when troubles come or when trials come your way consider it an opportunity for great joy <laughs> and you read that and you're going serious how, how can troubles bring joy? He goes on, For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfected and complete, needing nothing. And then let's skip down to verse 12. God blesses those who patiently endure testing, trials, some translations say, and temptation. 
Afterwards, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me, for God never tempts to do wrong. So just a comment here about these words. The word tempt and the word test are not the same. The word trial and tempt are not the same thing. Temptation does not come from God. Temptation comes from the pit. Temptation comes when we want to do things our own way. We have our own desires that we want to fulfill which are not in line with God. And when that happens, then we are tempted to go away from what is right. But trials and tribulations, that's a different matter. Those things come to us right here. Let's read that again. Verse 12, James 1, 12. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and, tempta and temptation. Okay? Either one, either one. When you go through, whether the enemy is trying to bring you down or whether God's going to test you th through certain things, we have to endure. However, um, let's go down to 13. And remember, when you're being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God never tempts to do wrong. He never tempts anyone. Temptation comes from our own desires when we, we, which entice us and drag away. These desires give birth to sinful acts, and when sinful is allowed to grow, it gives birth to de death. Don't be misled, my brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God our Father who created all the lights of heaven. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He, choose, he chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. Temptation tries to bring us down. What do tests do? And, and sometimes we, we make things complicated and they're so basic and they're so easy. When do we start tests in life? the average person. Grade one? I think so, huh? Grade one. Unless your parents doing homeschool teaching. But basically tests start in grade one. What are tests for? Our tests are for passing so that we can go from grade one to grade two. And tests continue to get us from grade two to grade three. And then four to five, and so forth. Nothing wrong with tests. Nothing wrong with them. Because tests simply display if we've got the material. Trials are there by God to see if we simply get it. Do we understand what God is doing in our lives? And we let God do the tests. And we let him do the trials. Now, here's the sad part about it, is that sometimes when God uses other people <laughs> to do the trials and testing, we, we resist it. But sometimes God does it himself or he uses other people. In any case, we have to understand the difference between temptations and testings. And let the testings of life come. Simply do your homework. Just before we were, came out, we were in the prayer room. I invite you all every Sunday. You're welcome at 5.30 to join us for prayer. And the request came again to pray for those in high school. I think it was high school, right? You said, yeah, they're writing their exams now. Well, we can only pray, at least I can only pray. When, when our kids were going to school, pray for them. Well, I, I only felt good to pray if they studied. <laughs> And if they studied, okay, I'm praying for you. You didn't study? I'm going to pray a different prayer. I'm going to pray you have discipline to study. Basic, simple. When we go through life's tests, our testings come to ask us the question, have we studied? Have we soaked ourselves in God's word? Have we soaked ourselves in prayer? And, you know, 
I, I'm just trying to imagine right now if they're if grade 10s, 11, 12s, whoever's writing the exams or universities. Can you imagine the dysfunction if you go to school, study, and there's no test? What a dysfunctional school. Because how do you know if you pass? Like, when I go to a, a doctor or dentist or get an engineer to build a house or do something, I hope when they went to school, they passed the tests. And not just by 50% or 51%, but with flying colors, with 80s and 90s. We want that in life. And guess what? Our Heavenly Father wants this as well. And so when the times are good, when times are refreshing, what do we do? We study God's Word. And life is peaceful and it's calm. And the sun is shining, the blue skies are out, small, small breeze, just enough in the sails to get the boat going. And it's during those times that we study the Word of God. Why? Because sooner or later, the winds will pick up, the clouds will roll in, the lightning will strike, the waves become high, and as the disciples found out, the boat's about to go down. And Jesus rebuked him. He said, didn't you learn anything from the lesson? They failed the tests. But then he gave them grace again to re go back and restudy. And Peter, just now in this passage that we looked, he failed the test. He was on trial. But praise God, just like school. Otherwise, I'd still be in grade 12 or grade 1. If we fail, we get another chance. And even if you have to go to a particular grade twice, it's all right. Sooner or later, we're going to get past it. And as we grow in Christ and as we mature in Christ, let the storms come. Let them come. It's an opportunity to evaluate and to see, do I know my God? The good news is that we can pass tests. The bad news is... <laughs> The tests keep coming, and the tests will keep coming until they lay us in a coffin in the front of a church and carry us out. That's the final one. That's the, it's over then. We graduate. We get our final certificate, and we're done. We get to go home. But God is merciful, isn't he? Amen. Amen. 